Hello, Penguinauts, I'm the Beardy Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. In the last episode, we visited Valm, refueled all of our spacecraft, and then landed here on Tilos, which has actually got quite high gravity, 0.9 Gs, if I remember correctly. So that means driving a rover is actually quite pleasant, because we don't really have any risk of us soaring up into the air after going over a tiny little speed bump, and then having to control endless tumbling <laughs> as we wait for the rover to come to a stop. So that meant that we could get up to some pretty uh, high speed and make this journey to the top of the nearest mountain to try and visit two more biomes and get more science quite a bit more bearable. In fact, actually enjoyable. I put on some music and uh, yeah, I really actually quite enjoyed this long trip. And I have sped up to eight times speed though, so you don't have to watch it in its entirety. I did consider actually making a stream and streaming this um, and chatting with you guys while I was doing the journey, but uh, in the end I decided against it because uh, I wasn't entirely feeling up to it. But let me know if that's something you guys would be interested in in future, just a big long exploration mission of a moon or something and just having a stream and just chatting to you guys for a bit. Uh, I think that could be really quite good fun. But anyway, as I said, so we're traveling up the nearest mountain. It was uh, quite a quite a trek to try and find the actual route up, um, making sure we're not going up an incline too sharp for, uh, for our wheels to actually climb up but you see there we finally managed to wake our way out of the Bob Impact crater and get to our first new biome so we just plant a flag overlooking the desolation that uh, Bob's impact caused get a rather beautiful view of the rings and then we continue off up the mountain so we've got quite a ways to go yet um, we actually have to get to the top of this mountain then go across quite a narrow little uh, passage before we can then ascend to the top of the next mountain over, uh, which you can just see over there to the top right. And have a few little uh, little mishaps as we were going along, but thankfully uh, nothing that actually damaged the rover. So here's that very, very narrow passage we have to get across before we can get over to the final mountain, which actually goes high enough to count as another biome. Trying to get as much science as we can, since this body is so difficult to land on with 0.9 Gs of surface gravity and no atmosphere, the science we can get from here is worth quite a lot. You see there uh, we ran out of daylight so just had to fast forward until the following morning and then we can continue our ascent up. Now <laughs> this got pretty steep at times um, so we had to you know a few times sort of go almost sideways up the mountain and, and circle around until we could find a slightly slightly gentler incline to climb up. Uh, so it took a little while to get up here but uh, but really as I said it was really quite a relaxing drive and for some reason having the chem cam so we can actually sort of see things from the rover's point of view made this uh, a lot more interesting. I know it's, it's really quite good fun to be able to see things from sort of the Kerbal's point of view and have a, a continuous camera feed of uh, the Kerbal's faces and everything. It makes it feel a little bit more immersive in my opinion to have sort of their point of view and then my sort of backseat third person point of view. You see they're uh, just about managing to make our way up uh, some of the steeper inclines. We had a few sort of false summits uh, which does remind me of uh, I remember when I went on a hiking trip across the Pennines and you think you're, you're just about to reach the summit and you just get over it and then you realize nope nope you're only halfway up. Uh, it's uh, quite a common occurrence it's quite soul destroying until suddenly you get to the top and you're like, oh, here we are, wonderful. Uh, and see there, look at that. What a gorgeous, gorgeous view we get of Reaper and Arados there. But uh, it's not actually a different biome, which is a little bit strange. The summit biome isn't actually at the summit of the mountain. Um, I decided to explore around a little bit because I was, I was pretty sure we were at high enough altitude so I thought I would just move around a little bit and yeah sure enough um, for some reason we move down the mountain a little bit and then we stumble across the summit biome uh, so it's a little bit strange that the summit biome isn't actually at the summit uh, <laughs> of this mountain but uh, nevertheless we do get some really rather beautiful views and lots and lots of science to take with us. I'm not sure how much more science we actually need. I mean, we've we've unlocked all the tech we're going to need to actually uh, go to another star system and colonize it. Um, anything we get now is essentially just upgrades for all our reactor technology and things that will make uh, make our time a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, I'm getting I'm gradually getting a little bit less compulsive about hoarding science um, because 
I think I just got into the habit of doing it because we run on, I think, 60% science or uh, something this entire playthrough. So we've needed all the science we can get uh, and farm, essentially. But uh, although a lot of the later technologies in the tech tree are worth a lot of science, um, yeah, I, I get the feeling we're, we might get close to completing the tech tree uh, before we actually launch the mission, what with our wasteland mission and also this mission going off to Eltos. And yes, I had an overwhelming response on the previous video uh, when I asked whether or not you guys thought it would be worth going to Eltos. And yeah, you guys pretty much all agreed, yes, definitely divert to Eltos. All, all the way out here on the edge of the solar system anyway, might as well make the most of it and divert um, around to Eltos. We have more than enough Glycorol to refreeze our Kerbals, and if we're careful with our landing on Valiant, we'll have more than enough Oxidizer for our SSTO to descend down to the surface of Eltos as well. It turns out Eltos actually has a uh, lower mass. It's smaller than Valiant. Valiant's uh, surface gravity is, I believe, 0.4 Gs, whereas the surface gravity of Eltos is only about 0.25, uh, which is surprising. Though Eltos does have um, a much thicker atmosphere. It goes up to 50 kilometers, whereas Valiant's only goes up to 20. So you see there, we've uh, headed back to our Ragnar lander, and we are now blasting back up into orbit, trying to do the most efficient ascent that we can, because every drop of oxidizer that we can save, even on this spacecraft, um, is more oxidizer we're going to have for our Valiant descent and ascent back up, more importantly, and then, um, of course, our Eltos mission as well. So we're going to try and do things as efficiently as we can and use RCS uh, as much as we can. But uh, yeah, we get ourselves a encounter that actually goes to 0.0 uh, .0 kilometers. I remember seeing uh, a really good KSP meme on the, on Reddit, which was um, <laughs> men only want literally one thing, and then it's just the encounter separation 0.0, .0 kilometers <laughs> which honestly could not be more true um yeah i, I <laughs> perhaps there's a reason why i've gone through so many relationships whenever i'm uh, close with anyone and chatting with them a lot and i'm playing a lot of kerbal i send them lots of pictures of what i'm doing i'm like look look i built a rocket check it out and they're like yes yes that's uh that's wonderful darling thank you <laughs> but uh you know if someone can't accept my uh passion for rockets then uh yeah you know I think they're in the wrong place. But anyway, so we uh, ascended back up to Morningstar, docked the Ragnar, or at least the upper stage of the Ragnar back, and now we're finished around Tillo. So we're going to head to the outermost moon of the Reaper system, Valiant, which of course used to be Val. Now Val used to have a subsurface ocean, um, but now with Archangel expanding and heating its surface, most of the ice has melted and exposed the ocean beneath. So it's actually had a lot longer for life to develop than Arados did. Um, Arados was sterile. We were looking for life in those oceans, but we didn't find anything, probably due to the extremely high saline content of the water. Canonically, I, I say canonically like KSB actually has canon, but technically canonically, um, lave is uninhabitable. The water um, has to be, I'm pretty sure the water is toxic for it to actually be liquid um, at the temperatures of lathe. It should be frozen. Um, and I think someone did all the chemistry or something and figured out, yeah, no, the atmosphere, um, even though it has oxygen in it and the water of lathe are actually toxic, at least to us. Um, perhaps another life form could survive it, but we didn't find anything on Arados and it seems uh, it has always been sterile. But perhaps the subsurface ocean of Val was a little bit more friendly to life. I mean, there's you know a lot of camps that believe that Europa may well have life on it because tidal forces from Jupiter create a lot of volcanic activity. So it almost certainly has volcanic vents. And uh, a lot of people believe that's where life actually originated on Earth down um, at the bottom of the ocean and then life developed the ability to photosynthesize later on, um, which is really quite an interesting theory. You see there we're arriving at Valiant and it actually has an bit of an atmosphere now, a very thin one. Uh, I believe at sea level it actually has 0.6 atmospheres of pressure, um, but it only goes up to 20 kilometers, so the atmosphere thins rapidly. So uh, our SSTO is only really going to be able to glide uh, at very high speeds and at very low at um, altitudes. So what we're going to need to do is lower our periapsis 
right down into the atmosphere and essentially glide through the lower atmosphere as long as we can, trying to save as much fuel as we can uh, and very gradually slow down. And then this is essentially the reason why I packed the uh, parachutes because... I remember when I when I landed on um, the wasteland, we sort of had this this problem where we had to land at almost 200 meters per second because the atmosphere was uh, was so thin. So um, on this one, though, I did actually account for that. Um, so we're going to glide in at 200 meters per second, uh, and just before we touch down, we're going to fire our parachutes, open our air brakes, and try and slow down, slow right, right, right down the instant before we touch the ground. Because if we slow down. Um, too early, then we're going to essentially fall out of the sky. We won't be able to actually produce enough lift to uh, lift the aircraft. I remember I was chatting about this in the Discord and I had someone be like, well, actually, Beardy, my SSTO can, you know, glide happily at 50 meters per second. And I was like, yeah, what planet were you on? They're like, Kerbin. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> this SSTO was able to land perfectly fine without parachutes on Arados even, and on solitude, um, but that's not going to cut it here on Valiant. The atmosphere is just too thin. We're going to need some parachutes uh, to actually slow down because the surface is also very bumpy. You know, if we had a very long, flat stretch of land, I mean, on Arados, we used a long beach. Um, but if we have one of those here on Valiant, easily accessible to us, um, then perhaps we would have been able to land without it. But, uh, but no, we're just going to use parachutes and play things a little bit on the safe side. You can see there we're actually using our RCS to lower our periapsis. As I said, we are trying to save as much oxidizer as possible. And in fact, I actually figured out roughly how much oxidizer we would need. Um, and I pumped as much as I could out of it and back into the Ragnar lander. That's why we kept it on because we don't actually have any other storage on Morningstar for oxidizer. So we filled up the Ragnar back with oxidizer um, to try and reduce the weight of this Mustang SSTO. And then we pumped about a third of the liquid fuel out uh, into the rest of Morningstar because if we're not going to be using the fuel, there is no point in carrying it. So we might as well lower the weight of the spacecraft um, and try and save as much Delta V as possible because by this point I was committed to trying to do this Eltos mission. And some people have pointed out that yes, I, I could just fly back to Valm. I did leave the Severo lander in orbit in case we needed it and refuel again. But I really don't want to have to do that. <laughs> it would take quite a bit of time to go back down to Valm's orbit, link back up with the Severo lander, and then refuel all the spacecraft again. Um, yeah, I really don't want to have to do that. So it's much easier just to try and do things as efficiently as possible uh, with this and then actually be able to go straight to Eltos um, once we have gone back up into orbit. So you see here we're gliding for quite an extended period of time just trying to very gradually bleed off speed as we descend through the different layers of the atmosphere. It is a very thin atmosphere but it is just about thick enough with the really rather wide wings of this SSTO uh, to actually generate a bit of lift. You see there we're deploying our air brakes and just trying to slow down as much as possible. Try not to overshoot this uh, continent here which seems to be our best bet for landing. See there as we go over each biome, we are having to open up the cargo bay so that we can expose our uh, atmospheric scan and actually measure the constituents of Valiant's atmosphere. You see there just passing over yet another biome, yep, opening the cargo bay of the rover and opening the cargo bay of the SSTO. I did consider not taking the rover back up into orbit to try and save a little bit more Delta V. Uh, and then I realized all of our scientific equipment uh, <laughs> is on the rover. The actual SSTO itself in a bid to save parts doesn't have any science equipment on it. So it would be kind of pointless sending this down to Eltos uh, without the rover. So we're just going to have to try and do things very efficiently. Sort of doing a bit of a, a Miller's Planet from Interstellar here, trying to do everything really, really fast. Not very great but very very efficiently. So you have trying not to fire our engines at all. So far all we've used is RCS to lower our orbit down into the atmosphere and since then we have just been gliding just trying to bleed off as much speed as possible with our air brakes deployed and now we're getting into the thicker parts of the atmosphere we're actually managing to bite the atmosphere with our aircraft and generate a bit of lift but uh, we're not quite slowing down fast enough so we're having to sort of do a bit of a beggar's canyon back home and just have to light the engines for a split second there just to get a little bit more lift um, go over that big hill there but uh, just ahead of us we have quite a long beach and since we want to be exploring the oceans anyway it seems like as good a landing site as any so we're just going to try lower our landing gear 
and head in for a landing. But uh, unfortunately, we lost a little bit too much speed, started falling towards the ground. So we have to light the, the engines again, and we're just heading in for a landing. Fire the parachute. Whoa! Okay, had a little bit of a bumpy landing. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was going to have to load a quick save on that one. But uh, thankfully, firing the front, the nose-mounted parachute managed to stabilize us, and we managed to come in for a landing. So that was a little bit of a Kerbal landing, but uh, if any Kerbal is capable of that, it's our slightly crazy ace pilot Katrina Kerman. So we get ourselves out, and we plant a flag. So on this crew, we've got Katrina, Tibbin, and we have Herman as well as our resident field scientist. We're just getting Tibbin out to repack all the parachutes there. Tibbin's actually gone down to all of the planetary surfaces, I believe, because uh, Tibbin is the only engineer we have on this mission. Because, I mean, we only needed one. We needed a field scientist, we needed two scientists for each lab, we needed a pilot to maintain control of Morningstar and a pilot for each away mission, uh, making it sound like Star Trek. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, we only really needed one engineer uh, to go down to each of the surfaces and make sure that uh, if our wheels took any damage, we could repair them and, of course, to repack our parachutes and all the rest. So, much like we did on Arados, we are sending the PAX Exploration rover into the ocean and starting its electric engine and beginning an exploration of Valiant's seas. I believe it's KSP Interstellar that adds the scientific instrument that lets us analyze the composition of the oceans and it gives us a filthy amount of science, probably because it is such a unique circumstance actually being able to analyze the ocean uh, of another world. You can only use it in, of course, one biome on very few celestial bodies and as such it is quite unique, but it gives us well over a thousand science just for that experiment alone. But now we've done all of our science, it's time to descend into Valiant's Ocean and see if we can find anything of interest. And of course at first I thought, well, yeah, this is going to be much the same as Arados, we're just going to go on through the water for a bit, uh, get some pretty views, but in the end find nothing of interest. But my my, was I pleasantly surprised. I'm pretty sure you can just see something peeking through the haze of the water there. Yes, a giant husk of an ancient life form. It seems to have been preserved by whatever the composition of this ocean is, but it is the corpse of a giant alien squid kraken, you could perhaps call it. This is truly, truly a remarkable discovery. However, it seems the changing environment, perhaps the warming oceans, the changing composition of the oceans, the loss of the ice sheet protecting them from the harsh radiation of Archangel, it seems to have wiped them all out. And all that is left is this giant corpse at the bottom of the ocean. Still though, what a remarkable discovery. It seems there was life in Val's subsurface ocean after all, but it has long since died out. And with that discovery, it's time for us to head on back to the SSTO. Because uh, in the next episode, we're going to do a land expedition to the top of one of the nearby mountains, get some science from one of the other nearby biomes, and then we will head back on up to orbit and back up to Morningstar with news and all the readings of this remarkable discovery we have found. If there was life at the bottom of Val's Oceans, perhaps we will find more life in another star system when we do eventually travel to Valentine. But that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I do hope you have enjoyed, and I will see you all next time.